Hello, and welcome to MC Squared. On this podcast, you can enjoy deep discussions and interviews about everything science with the best minds in the field. I'm Sanjum Sangari, and this episode's topic will be the recent successful demonstration of high-fidelity quantum teleportation. The discovery will alter and improve the technology of data storage and the quantum internet immensely. With me today, I have Dr. Raju Valiwerthi from Caltech, a key member of the research team responsible for achieving this kind of quantum teleportation for the first time in history. Hello, Dr. Valiwerthi. Thank you so much for appearing on our podcast. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, hi, Sunjum. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it right, but uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's really, it's really, I'm excited to talk with you today. So before we begin, I think it's important for the audience to get to know the basics of the science behind your discovery, um, because even the term quantum teleportation uh, sounds, frankly, pretty incredible. So what exactly is quantum teleportation and how does it work? Right. So quantum teleportation is basically a disembodied transfer of quantum information. So it's basically transferring quantum information from one location to another, but without using any physical carrier. Right. Okay, so if we think like classically, right, if you want to send information from one location to another, you basically take your information and code it onto something, for example, I don't know, light, uh, for example, for your current internet, that's what you do. You encode the information that you want to send on the light and you send it from one location to another through fiber optics uh, or some free space channel if you're using satellite, some uh, physical channel. So you're basically using some physical entity to transfer this information from one location to another. So in the quantum teleportation, you can do this transfer uh, without using any physical carrier that is uh, that is directly transferring this information from one location to another. Right, so the way it works, uh, so you need uh, two main ingredients uh, to do this quantum teleportation. One is quantum entanglement. Okay, quantum entanglement again, uh, it's this only uh, is this property that exists only uh, in quantum mechanics that you have let's say two particles now the information is encoded in the correlations between them and not on the individually what i mean by that is let's say you have these two entangled particles and you do measurements on each of them and they will look completely random as if they are not connected to each other so there is no information there but if you look at the correlations of the results of the measurements that you do on them, you see, you see that there is a pattern and you, get, you can get some information from that. So these are the special entangled particles. So once you have this entanglement, right? And you have this information to, do, to, to be teleported or to be transmitted. So you take this uh, uh, information and you interfere this information with one of the entangled particles and you do a measurement, which is called bell state measurement. We can get into that more later. And if this bell state measurement is successful, then basically what you're doing is you're transferring the information of your original uh, particle onto the other entangled particle, not the one that you interfere uh, with the current particle. Okay, so basically there is no physical particle that travels uh, between the, the, the original uh, information carrier to the final location where the information ended up with. So that's how, that's basically how you do quantum teleportation. Right. And so getting into a little bit more detail uh, what was your team, uh, your research team that worked with you on this project? What were your team and you able to do or discover about quantum teleportation that wasn't previously known in the subject? So, yeah, so quantum teleportation, it's, it was proposed some 20 years ago, okay? Uh, it's been demonstrated several times in the lab. So people know it works uh, and 
platform it exists. Uh, but most of the demonstrations have been restricted to lab for a very long time, and rightly so because it's uh, it's not very difficult, but it's difficult to achieve all the right conditions to be able to see or achieve this phenomena. Um, only recently, there are more and more demonstrations that reached uh, or that went out of the lab into the real world. What I mean by that is now. Uh, the teleportation is sort of happening inside the lab. It's happening between two, dif two different physical locations, uh, uh, like separated by tens of kilometers. Okay. Um, so our experiment basically demonstrated uh, that we can do this teleportation in that kind of uh, real world scenario, not in the lab. Uh, and we can achieve very high fidelity by that, I mean, fidelity is basically measuring how close your teleported information is to your original information, right? Uh, if you have high fidelity, if you have 100% fidelity, means you extracted all the uh, information that you uh, began with or that you wanted to uh, teleport. So we were able to show on an average above 90% fidelity uh, and for sustained periods of time. So before there was never uh, uh, this kind of experiment which is running long term, like uh, we ran our experiment for weeks uh, and we showed that this still exists, this, we can still uh, maintain this, uh, that's one. And the second thing is we were able to develop a, a theoretical model which was able to identify all the experimental imperfections that were going on uh, in our experiment um, and basically able to model exactly uh, what, what are the kind of fidelities we should expect given the imperfections we have in our experiment. So that, and, and it did, so that our model was able to accurately predict what kind of fidelities we get given the experimental imperfections we have. So that also gave us uh, some straightforward path uh, to even improve this fidelity even more, to be able to go closer to uh, 100%. And the third one is basically uh, all these combined together shows that our, uh, our experiment or our setup can be uh, deployed in a real world network uh, right now and be able to maintain or, be, or uh, make it uh, work for sustained periods of time. Right. And, and then this model that you described where you and your team sort of um, highlighted like the imperfections of, of the quantum teleportation that you demonstrated, is this something that you, got, um, that you and your team sort of keep to yourself in determining like what to change or what to improve? Or is this something that you sort of distribute to um, a bunch of different scientists who are doing similar things to just overall benefit um, how it's being uh, made? Like how quantum teleportation is being achieved. Uh, right. This, I mean, this model right now uh, uh, that I described is published. Uh, it's, for, it's there for everyone to see. So I expect uh, this model, which was not there earlier, um, would ben benefit a lot of other researchers uh, working on similar uh, setups to identify imperfections in their imperfections and also the impact of those, how much impact these imperfections have on the final fidelities in their setups too. Yeah, I mean, uh, so one of the things that was not known earlier is that, so for, for instance, I mentioned imperfection. So let's say, uh, so we are using uh, uh, weak coherent uh, lasers uh, to encode our qubits. So, when you want qubits are these two level quantum information systems. Okay, so before um, one of the imperfections uh, you encounter when you use this kind of setup is this weak coherent laser. Uh, ideally, you only want a single photon to encode a single qubit, but this uh, weak coherent source will emit sometimes two photons or three photons, which is an imperfection. So uh, there was not an accurate 
uh, description of the impact this kind of uh, uh, you know this kind of two photon or three photon emissions will have on your uh, final fidelity. So I expect that people will take this uh, imperfection. Uh, I mean, more accurately in the future setups. This is one right. example, but we have a lot of other. Yeah. And did your team uh, do a similar thing when you when you were preparing your uh, instance of quantum teleportation, where like you um, you took like the base model and then you looked at other people's uh, models, where they describe what imperfections they had, and then you and your team worked to improve those as well. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Um, for example, the the photon number imperfection that I mentioned before, a lot of people modeled it, but uh, making a lot of assumptions on like, okay, you're using a very low intense source, so you can restrict uh, the number of photons that you can consider to one or two and so on. So we wanted to do better than that. So we kind of uh, removed all those uh, assumptions or most of the assumptions and went um, uh, as close to the real uh, physical system that we can. And that really helped, uh, I think, to model our uh, final system in a better way. Yeah. And would you say the process that um, you and other teams who work in this field are used to sort of create a bigger and better instance of quantum teleportation? Would that be more of a trial and error thing where you like change different variables to see what works and what doesn't, or more of a troubleshooting thing where you do uh, mostly what another team before you has done, except um, fine tweaking or fine tuning uh, certain parts of it to make it a little better? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's kind of both. Um, like, obviously, you build on the expertise or on the previous experiments that are already. Uh, demonstrated, uh, so you you first go to that level, right? To uh, to be able to replicate what all what the others have already shown, and then uh, you do this trial and error. I mean, most of the cases you have a really good hunch on the things that you need to improve, the knobs that you have to change uh, to do better. Uh, but in the cases that you cannot, or when you don't have this hunch, you do have to do this trial and error to see uh, which one works and which one doesn't. And basically, this model really helped us to say, okay, uh, this imperfection has more impact than the, other, than the other one. So it's better to work more on this one uh, to improve this than the other one, which will have only incremental uh, uh, improvement on your setup. Yeah. And um, earlier when we were talking uh, in a different question, I believe, uh, you mentioned that the theory of quantum teleportation was only about uh, two decades old. So it's still a relatively new concept. So I was wondering if um, on top of the basics of the science, which you talked about a little earlier, um, could you give us like a little bit of a history or the timeline for studies of the phenomena, like how it grew, how you understood more of it, like what were the major events in the in the past twenty years? Uh, right. So the first uh, proposal for teleportation, just a the first seminal, uh, I guess, invention or theoretical proposal, was proposed in nineteen ninety three, uh, and they basically introduced this term quantum teleportation because you have these. Uh, information being destroyed at, destroyed or disappearing at one location and appearing in some other location. And four years or yeah, in 1993, and I think the first demonstrations were done already in 1997, 1998, showing, okay, this, uh, this can actually be done uh, in real life. Uh, and both of these demonstrations kind of used uh, photonic systems um, encoding quantum information in a different way, but uh, done in photonic systems. Uh, since then, there have been uh, you know a lot of uh, demonstrations that I mentioned previously. Most of them in the lab, uh, basically improving uh, the fidelity and also the the rates. Uh, and also there have been uh, 
several other experiments involving different physical systems, not just photons. For example, teleporting information between a photonic system and an atomic system, between two atomic systems, and so on. Um, and right uh, after that, uh, there has been, I think, uh, a major milestone, I would say, was this demonstration of quantum teleportation between two islands. Uh, separated by, I think it was like 140 kilometers uh, from Vienna's group. And then uh, right after that, even in China, like actually going out the, outside the lab and between uh, different remote locations. Uh, right, even in the, like th this was really important to show, okay, this is not just uh, like a technology that can be, you know, shown in the lab. This can, this can actually be, uh, used for real world application. Uh, that, this was really important. Those demonstrations were really important to show this. Uh, but in, in those demonstrations, um, right, the teleportation, actual teleportation happened at a short distance in the lab. And then the teleported information was sent to a long location. Okay, this, this was true for a long time, like until 2012. And then in 2016, uh, uh, our team in Calgary, I was working in Calgary at the time, and uh, uh, independently another Chinese group uh, from Zhan Wei Pan in China, we have shown that the actual teleportation can also be done at long distances. Uh, we showed up to, I think, uh, 20 kilometers of distance uh, at the time uh, this was the record for the actual uh, teleportation distance. And we also showed that it, that it can be done with the real world deployed fiber uh, that is used to distribute uh, internet. And right now we showed that this can be done uh, with real world conditions and for sustained periods of time. Right. And um, just listening to you like explain about quantum teleportation, um, you're really proficient in like not only the science uh, of quantum teleportation, but also like the history of the, of the theory and the processes and all of that. So I, I was wondering, uh, how long have you been studying quantum teleportation? And like, what steps have you um, done, like besides your recent study uh, regarding quantum teleportation? Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, like, I first got introduced to the concept, I think when I was in my undergrad, uh, I was doing this internship at a quantum institute. Uh, and right, this was just one of the first things that you, that you get to know, okay, this, uh, I mean, this uh, quantum teleportation and how to do, like how it actually works in terms of math and everything. That's when I first got introduced and physically getting to implementing it, it, uh, it was in my PhD that I mentioned when I was in Calgary. So at that time, in, during my PhD, I was working on uh, Bell state measurement that I mentioned before. It's basically taking uh, two information carriers, let's say two photons, and making a Bell state measurement on them which is mathematically to say that you have to measure the two qubit state uh, in the Bell basis, okay? Um, so I was working on that and to, to actually make this happen, what you need to do is you need to make these two information carriers, these two photons in our case, indistinguishable. In the sense they have to look, uh, they have to, you, you have, you cannot be able to tell one apart from the other, okay? For this bell state measurement to work, that's what you have to do. So during my first two years of my PhD, I was basically working on that. Uh, like if you're able to do this bell state measurement, you can do a lot of other things like quantum key distribution, uh, which is more secure and so on. So that was my focus at the time. And then uh, we had all the, like once, uh, we were proficient in making this bell state measurement. Our lab at the time had all the resources to be uh, to actually perform quantum teleportation outside the lab, and that's how uh, I got uh, 
uh, introduced and pulled into this project at the time. So we had the resource, uh, as I was mentioning before, quantum entanglement, and then uh, we had this uh, bell state measurement, and we put all these things together, and and then we were able to show, okay, it actually works. Uh, and here, by improving more of our uh, in Caltech, uh, by here I mean in Caltech, uh, by improving more our experimental systems, we were able to show that you can actually sustain it for long periods of time and you can do it better with better fidelities. Right. And you were explaining that um, when you're undergoing the process uh, of like doing quantum teleportation, demonstrating quantum teleportation, um, the way that you uh, that the way that you demonstrated is by like taking small amounts of information in qubits and uh, transferring them through particle entanglement. Uh, so could you describe the process of like um, how this, like what kind of information this was that you were using or like um, how it was transferred? You explained a little bit about that, but more about the information side. Right. So the, as I mentioned, the quantum information um, that we, so the, um, the degree of freedom, let's say, that we use to encode this information was timing of the photon. Okay, so let's say you have a photon and you put it into a beam splitter. Okay, that basically means you are uh, you have the photon going into the beam splitter. Fifty percent of the time it can reflect, and fifty percent of the time it can transmit. Okay. And let's say you did that, and then in one of the paths, let's say in the transmitted path, you put a relatively larger delay with respect to the uh, path that the photon takes uh, when it's reflecting, okay? And if you combine these two paths, so quantum mechanically, what will happen is that this photon is in a superposition of taking either this long path or this short path. So you have this photon uh, basically having this two, having a superposition of uh, early, which we call when the photon takes uh, uh, the short path because it comes early and the photon uh, that takes the long path, uh, we call it late. So that's the degree of freedom that we use to encode our information early and late, okay? Um, and so this is our uh, information. So for example, uh, your, um, the information that you want to teleport can be, okay, your photon is an early, or your photon can be late, or your photon can be a superposition, or your photon can be in a, um, in a superposition with some complex phase between these two parts and so on. So, so this is our information that we wanted to teleport. Uh, and the entangled photons, so to be able to teleport, we have to create the entanglement in the same degree of freedom. So you create a time bin entanglement. That means you have two photons uh, which are entangled in time. So that means if one photon is in early, the other photon is also in early. If one photon is in late, the other photon is also in late. And uh, also it also works for the superposition. So if one photon is in early plus late, means it is in a superposition of early and late. The other photon is also in a superposition of uh, early and late. So right. once you right, so once you create uh, this uh, time in entanglement, also your information that you want to teleport, you basically do this bell state measurement that I uh, mentioned before, and then you'll be able to teleport the time information or time. Uh, quantum information from one location to that. Right. And thank you for clearing up the, uh, like sort of the science of the quantum teleportation a little bit more. Um, that's really interesting as well. And now uh, moving a little more specifically into uh, specifically your experiment uh, that you did with your research team. I was reading your um, research article that you, um, that you published, uh, your paper, and it was really interesting. There was a lot of uh, really interesting research um, that you guys proposed. And in your paper, uh, you highlight the importance of quantum teleportation in regards to something called uh, the quantum internet. So could you explain what the quantum internet uh, is and like how it works? Right. So quantum internet, uh, I think is 
which was coined in 2008 by Professor Jeff Kimball here at Caltech. Um, right, so it's basically, um, let's say you have uh, different quantum information processing units. Uh, we, can, we can talk about the, why you want to do it later, but let's say you have these uh, quantum information processing units, very similar, I mean, the classical analog will be your classical information processing unit, which are just computers. And if you have this kind of different computers, either classical or quantum in a network, then we have to exchange information between each other, okay? Um, classically, it's, uh, it's simple to do it. You just, um, you know, send zeros and ones. And, uh, and the quantum analog, you exchange this information by means of uh, quantum teleportation, okay? And once you have all these kind of quantum information processing units connected to each other and exchanging information coherently by this uh, means of quantum teleportation, uh, you have then what you can call a quantum internet. So basically this will, this has several advantages like First of all, uh, I mean, the very basic you get is it's secure. Uh, you cannot get any information by eavesdropping uh, on the information that is being exchanged uh, between these quantum information processing units. And the other is if, if you're processing units or some kind of sensors, uh, you can improve uh, uh, the precision uh, that you can get on the sensing if all these processors are connected to each other. Uh, you can uh, build more powerful quantum computers, for instance. For example, if you have two 50 qubit quantum computers connected to each other, suddenly that uh, now in the total number of uh, qubits that you have in your uh, quantum computer is uh, 100, which will increase your computational power uh, tremendously. Uh, and finally, you, all, you can use this to basically simulate quantum mechanics. Like you have all these uh, processing units connected to each other, and then you can simulate some complex Hamiltonian that you are unable to simulate otherwise just using classical means. Right. And so um, moving on a little bit to talking about um, implications uh, of quantum teleportation, how can researchers and uh, other science use your quantum teleportation um, that you and your team have worked on and uh, many other people as well? How can these researchers and scientists use um, this quantum teleportation in fields of science other than how it is currently being used um, in your research? Other than it's being currently used, uh, like besides quantum internet, uh, mostly right. Um, the quantum teleportation it's a basic ingredient, basically for you know quantum communication, uh, the quantum internet that I just described, and also for quantum computing. So, but the it happens at different scales. Uh, you know, in the quantum computer, basically all those qubits are lying very close to each other. And in the quantum communication, uh, these are uh, separated by much uh, uh, longer distances. So um, other than that, uh, I, um, right. I mean, basically all the applications that I can see are derived <laughs> from these uh, two fields. Uh, from uh, quantum uh, computing, quantum networking. Uh, I guess in quantum sensing too, you can use it. There are some protocols when you have two quantum sensors uh, connected to each other by this kind of quantum teleportation, you can do better in terms of sensing. Um, I don't know. I don't know how well they could use this. Uh, all the implications are, I mean, are the currently known, I should say, uh, applications are these. But I mean, as you mentioned, this field is still new. 
so we don't know what other we honestly don't know all the potential uh, uh, future in future uh, applications that that this can be involved in so it's still uh, still up for research yeah right so moving out of uh, academia and the academic settings a little bit where uh, you guys are mostly testing um, and like testing the limits of quantum teleportation and what it can actually do. Um, let's say that quantum teleportation was able to now um, be used in a commercial aspect. Uh, what industries do you think quantum teleportation will significantly affect and like how would they be changed um, by using aspects of quantum teleportation? So, right. Um, the most immediate impact that I can see is on uh, like metropolitan scale networks, uh, which need to be more secure. Uh, so right now there are uh, several, um, uh, several projects or several uh, installations worldwide uh, where this kind of um, uh, critical infrastructure where you need absolute security are being secured by quantum technologies, for instance, uh, quantum key distribution. Uh, for instance, those technologies can be replaced by this kind of quantum teleportation technologies, which are traditionally shown to be more secure uh, than the um, quantum key distribution. So that's the very short term implications that I can see commercially. Uh, long term, right, long term, we, this, as I mentioned, uh, like this, the scale of the teleportation right now is done in metropolitan scale. By that I mean like tens of kilometers, uh, maximum like 50 kilometers or seven, 50 to 70 kilometers maybe. So in the long term, once we develop the so-called quantum repeater, we can actually uh, like increase the distance between the entities which were, from which uh, you can do teleportation. So in the really long term, you, we can see uh, or we can envision all the US connected by uh, this kind of quantum repeater where you can exchange quantum information from one location to another. Right. And um, I'm sure you know about this uh, already, considering that you are in the field of quantum teleportation and um, those kind of studies. But only a couple of months uh, before your discovery was published, the United States Department of Energy proposed a blueprint for a national quantum internet um, for the entirety of uh, the USA. So since quantum teleportation is so interconnected to uh, such a quantum internet, do you think that your team's recent research will play a part in this endeavor by the Department of Energy? Yeah, right. So we are uh, very, very much involved and closely connected. Uh, to this um, uh, initiative uh, by the US Department of Energy that you mentioned. So if you actually look at the blueprint, they mentioned like four key areas uh, of research that uh, we need to do in the next coming years. One is like providing the, like the building blocks for the qu uh, quantum internet, basically developing the building blocks and then integrating the networking devices and also uh, working on uh, like uh, routing, switching and repeating kind of technologies for entanglement. And the last one to enable error correction. So our work is very relevant to the first three points that, I, uh, that the DOE uh, uh, mentioned there. Um, so so this, this is, uh, I, I, I should not say the first step, this is one of the steps our experiment is kind of one of the steps that you need to take uh, to achieve uh, uh, the full vision uh, of the blueprint proposed by the DOE. Right. And so um, such like such a quantum internet, like encompassing such a large part um, of, of the country, I'm sure is like a very expensive uh, endeavor as well and pretty hard to like bring up and hard to maintain and things like that as well. So. Do you believe that, or like, what do you believe would be the timeline if um, a quantum internet were to be implemented now? Like, do you think that your research, or like 
all of the research in quantum teleportation right now um, is enough to get it um, fully set up and functioning? Uh, I would say no, we are not, we are, I, I don't think we are uh, like actually uh, setting up this technology everywhere. I think there's still a lot of R&D that needs to be done uh, before we can actually at, uh, arrive at a stage where we are ready to, uh, um, you know, make it uh, available for uh, general public and so on. So as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's expensive, uh, as you said, to bring it up all over the country. So I think the, the focus should be on primarily the R&D to exactly you know, find out all the limits and identify use cases exactly where it's useful and what are the limitations there uh, and how we can potentially improve um, and only then we should, uh, I think, uh, go ahead to uh, make it available for all the, uh, like a general public technology. Right. And so I'm um, talking a little bit more about um, just the theory of like a quantum internet. As we have seen in the past, um, like a lot of revolutionary technologies uh, that have been implemented have some form of negative implications or side effects uh, associated with them. Like for example, um, they can be susceptible to hackers who would use it for like um, malignant purposes, things like that. Like for example, uh, large scale surveillance or other things like that. So as of now, do you know of any such implications that installing a quantum internet might entail or is it more of a security purpose? So it would actually be uh, better to sort of protect against these uh, honestly, I mean, as I mentioned, it's, it's such a new field. Uh, I, I, I don't think we know, uh, like all the potential applications, for instance, uh, of a quantum network, if you were to build one and also then we would also don't know all the potential implications, uh, that we would have, uh, right now with the existing knowledge that we have, I don't think, I can't see any uh, uh, like uh, malignant activities. I can't foresee any malignant activities that one can do uh, using this kind of quantum internet. Um, one major, I mean, this is, I mean, let's say you build this really powerful quantum internet. Uh, so then if then you basically have a very powerful quantum computer if you have a very powerful quantum computer, it has, it has been shown that it can be used to uh, hack basically all the existing cryptography infrastructure. So that's why uh, NIST has put out uh, calls for new kinds of uh, cryptography techniques that we need to use uh, to be able to protect ourselves uh, from this kind of threat, which I think is still, uh, 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 like a bit far away uh, before we reach that stage. So maybe that's one aspect of the society that I can see uh, some kind of adverse effect. But again, as you mentioned, we can again use the same technology uh, to be able to do secure communication. So uh, yeah, right now I don't see, uh, maybe because I'm too close to the field, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you, as you mentioned, development in quantum, uh, quantum teleportation and just uh, this field in general is very new. Um, like researchers and scientists don't know um, so much about the topic right now as it, as it is. So uh, I don't know if you and your team are already embarking on sort of next steps in the process, but what do you believe are the next steps that will occur now in like the fields of research and physics that have to do with quantum teleportation uh, following your discovery and other people's discoveries. What do you believe are the next steps for these people um, with the knowledge that you currently have about quantum teleportation in terms of refining and sort of making it bigger and better? Right, exactly. So as you mentioned, bigger and better. So right now, uh, uh, the current uh, research goals that we're working on 
uh, is to increase the rates of uh, this quantum teleportation. So in our experiment, we were able to achieve around a few hertz, like successful quantum teleportation clicks a few every second. So we would like it to be more, uh, we would like to be, to be faster, get more uh, successful clicks so that it can be used for um, more advanced applications, for instance, connecting to sensors and so on. Um, make it more, uh, like achieve higher fidelities. As I mentioned, we were able to achieve on an average 90%, uh, and we want to get that number even higher, close, closer to 100%. Um, and already there are uh, several proposals, uh, like in Europe, for instance, uh, they're talking about a network uh, involving nitrogen vacancy centers. These are basically quantum information processing centers all connected to each other in a network. And they also talk to each other by means of uh, quantum teleportation. So this, this uh, kind of high fidelity will basically help uh, uh, to, to basically like build these preliminary quantum networks, which might not do something useful right away, but uh, show uh, that it's it's kind of like it's a first step towards that path, basically. Right, and so I also wanted to ask, um, as like I'm sure that the discovery and the use of quantum teleportation um, is a huge uh, milestone in your field. So, do you believe that the use of quantum teleportation will have uh, a major effect on modern technology? And if so, how do you plan on using or marketing this technique or um, the use of quantum teleportation in the future for science or even for public use? Uh, right, so as I mentioned, we don't know all the applications, uh, all the applications that you can do uh, once, you, once you have such a network, but we know that already with the existing known applications, it's gonna be uh, it's going to play a crucial role, um, uh, especially in the network, in securing our networks and doing better uh, with the sensors. Uh, so in the future for public, maybe as I mentioned, like for some critical infrastructure where you need really secure communication, this could play an important role. Um, and also to advance science to advance other fields of science. For example, I mentioned quantum simulation. Uh, if you have this kind of uh, quantum information processing units all connected to each other, then you, you will be able to simulate more complex quantum mechanical systems, which will help our understanding even more. That, that could be even more uh, interesting and useful. Right, I see. So now as sort of a conclusion to our interview, I wanted to ask you um, a final question. So since your research is relatively recent and even the science of quantum teleportation is uh, relatively recent, the science of uh, what you're studying right now is very novel. And I'm sure that little is known uh, of its capabilities as of right now, as, you, as you've said before. So as a conclusion to the interview, I wanted to ask you what you think about the future of quantum teleportation as you are one of the leading scientists in the field today. So there are a lot of ways that quantum teleportation could be used. It could be um, privatized and used by like uh, smaller private com companies, um, or it could be nationalized, used by like the Department of Energy um, as like sort of a network. So in your ideal future of what would happen, what do you believe is the best direction for quantum teleportation to go now? Right, that's a very good question. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, so uh, this experiment, I should mention uh, that it was done because a lot of uh, uh, research groups, a lot of institutes with, with their expertise came together to build this experiment. Uh, like for instance, I should mention uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, with NASA, 
they were crucial for this experiment because they uh, they are the their uh, we have the state of the art single photon detection technology developed from there, which was very important for us uh, to to bring uh, the capabilities higher. Uh, we have uh, uh, collaborators from uh, Harvard, from Fermilab, from University of Calgary. So a lot of groups with a lot of expertise had to come together uh, to build this experiment. And uh, so the next goals uh, for our group is basically uh, we have this test bed at Fermilab where we are uh, installing uh, this kind of networks. And we have already uh, collaborations with uh, several industry partners. Uh, for example, AT&T, we have collaboration with uh, uh, Corning, uh, and we have collaborations with uh, different uh, uh, optical component companies, okay? So all of these companies can basically use these test bits to test their products or expertise or technologies uh, in the test bed. So which will help, I think, uh, for all of them, uh, not only to test the technologies, but also to improve and grow together. Um, so that's the kind of collaboration uh, that would be, I think, ideal uh, to be able to uh, demonstrate or to be able to take this, uh, uh, this quantum networking uh, to, new, to new levels. Um, in the ideal future, uh, right, what I would, what I expect is, as I mentioned, this kind of uh, complex quantum information processing nodes, all of them talking to each other, uh, and then we are able to uh, simulate uh, this kind of complex uh, Hamiltonian, which would be very exciting, I think. I see. And that'd be really interesting just to see it um, sort of play out. Um, in our country and our economy um, in the next couple of years or decades or uh, however long it would take um, to fully set it up and function. So again, Dr. Valiverti, thank you so much um, for appearing on the podcast. It was really interesting uh, talking with you about your field. And um, after talking with you and learning more about the topic, I believe that quantum teleportation and the quantum internet uh, are both going to have huge, um, huge improvements for uh, the modern world and technology um, as we are using it today. So good luck with the rest of your um, projects. I hope that um, it all goes successfully after this. And again, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. It was fun uh, talking to you.